Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you this evening. Tonight, we're going to be continuing the study that we've been looking at over the last few weeks on the subject of denominations and their doctrines. And as we look at this subject of religious denominations, as we've done at the beginning of each of the previous lessons, I want us to once again take note of the reason why that we are looking at this subject, why it is one that is crucial for our understanding. And it's because of the words of Jesus in John 17, verses 20 through 23, where he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So in this passage we see that the desire that Jesus has for his followers is that they be united that they be one single united body. And so the question that we're looking at is how did it go from being this one united body to the point where it is today, where there are thousands of different religious denominations, thousands of different groups, all claiming to be Christian, all believing that they're doing the Lord's will, all believing that Their unique form of doctrine is that which is right and proper. Well, what we're looking at in these initial lessons is a historical overview, helping us get into the right frame of mind of how we've gone from being a united body down to the point that we are today. And where we left off in our study, we're talking about this period known as the Second Great Awakening. We talked about the fact that while this initially began in Europe, it really caught on in the United States. And some of the main things that were focused upon during this period known as the Second Great Awakening was this concept of religious revival, trying to get a zeal put back into faith. For so long, the religious groups that were in existence at that time, the things that they focused on more so was ritual. They came together, they they went through their traditions, they went through their services, but there was really no passion there, no zeal about their service to God. They also began to stress this concept of individual responsibility. It wasn't so much looking at bodies as a whole, but looking at each individual person. And certainly we all would agree that that is the appropriate way, that we look at each individual to determine who is responsible. Well, I'm responsible for myself, just as you are responsible for yourself, to make sure that we are acceptable to God. We also, during this period, we talked a little bit last time about the fact that this was the era in religious history where we see a lot of the big benevolent organizations come into establishment. We'll talk about a couple of those in the lesson tonight. But there began to be this focus that the church should have a greater impact on society than just spiritually. That the church can impact every aspect of a person's life. And so they developed this idea of not only improving oneself, but also improving the needs of society. They taught salvation is available to all people. We talked a little bit as well about how this was really the first time when African Americans were welcomed into many of the religious bodies. But the thing that we left off with last week, we talked about the fact that in this second great awakening, something that came to be stressed to the extreme is this concept of religious freedom. Now, we have religious freedom in this country. 
And whenever we talk about religious freedom, what we're talking about is that we have the freedom to serve and worship our God without fear of government interference. But during the Second Great Awakening, there were people who looked at that and they said, no, religious freedom means that we can believe whatever we want, we can worship however we want, we don't have to be bound to any... Uh, theological structure. We don't have to be bound to any certain denominational belief. And so really, during this period of time, from about the 1820s down through the turn of the last century, around the year 1900, we see many groups coming into existence that we would more than likely group under the heading of cults. Not necessarily denominations, but because their beliefs are so far removed from what we would see as being traditional scriptural beliefs. And we're going to talk about a few of those tonight. I made mention uh, after the lesson to a couple of people last time that this, is, this lesson tonight is where we're going to get into the good stuff, the fun stuff. But what I meant by that is this is really going to be where we start seeing some interesting things coming about. And the first of those is Mormonism. Whenever we think about Mormonism, we see that they now prefer to be referred to as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They don't necessarily uh, deny the term Mormon, but it's a term that they do not often refer to themselves by. Well, Mormonism began with a man by the name of Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith claimed to receive a special vision from an angel by the name of Moroni. And this angel supposedly led Smith to a set of golden plates. And on these golden tablets, there was a series of writing that he referred to as Reformed Egyptian. Well, you go back and you study languages, there's no such language as Reformed Egyptian. Well, then he claimed that this angel led him to the special tools that he would need in order to decode these tablets. Well, he supposedly used the tablets, he used these tools, and by the way, no one else ever saw the tablets, no one else ever saw the tools. But he used those things to prepare what he referred to as the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is believed to be inspired Scripture just as much as the Bible is. They claim that it is another testament or another gospel of Jesus Christ. But so much of what is contained therein is in such stark contrast to everything else that you find in the other gospel accounts, that it's hard to believe that anyone would accept the claims that they make. He later on would write two other pieces that he claimed were inspired, the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrines and the Covenants, and Mormons believe these to be inspired writings as well. Now, some of the unique things about the Mormon church, they believe that their leaders are still receiving revelations from God. That's where they get this terminology, latter-day saints. They say that, we, uh, that they today are saints just as the saints in the New Testament were. And just as the apostles received revelations from God, their apostles receive revelations from God. And so they designate themselves as Latter-day Saints. Well, this doctrine stirred up a lot of hatred toward Joseph Smith. It was so far removed from what every other Christian group believed that Joseph Smith was eventually driven out of New York and he went to the state of Missouri, and he established himself around Independence, Missouri. And while there in Independence, Missouri, he began preaching, he developed a large following, but there were many people that disagreed with him, had him arrested, and thrown into jail. 
Well, in the middle of the night, there was a mob. They came, they busted him out of jail, and they killed him. So, after that happened, there was a fight within that organization over who was going to take over, who was going to succeed him as the head of that body, and the body ended up dividing. And you had those who retained this Mormon or Latter-day Saints title that eventually aligned themselves with a man by the name of Brigham Young. And Brigham Young uh, took his followers to Utah, where they continue to be headquartered today. But then you had a smaller group who believed that Joseph Smith was the only Latter-day prophet. That no one else was going to come along that was going to receive any further revelations from God. And so they just needed to stick with these three works. The Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Doctrines and Covenants. And so the leadership of these groups divide. LDS, Latter-day Saints, they say, yes, our leaders are still receiving revelations. But you had a group that originally called themselves the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They now refer to themselves as the Community of Christ. And they look just to Joseph Smith's writings. They essentially are Mormon. We could say that they are a Mormon body. But rather than believing in this continuous cycle of Latter-day Revelations, they believe only in the writings of Joseph Smith. Now, what are some things that we are familiar with with the Mormons? How many of us have had Mormons knock on our door? They are very, very evangelistically minded. In fact, they require every young person at the point of their graduation from high school, before they are allowed to go to college or into the workplace, they have to spend a certain amount of time, and I'm not sure exactly how long it is, but they have to spend a certain amount of time um, devoted to mission work. And so you will see young people walking around, sometimes riding bicycles, and they are going around trying to spread the teachings of Joseph Smith. But one of the things that we need to be aware of with Mormonism, folks, they are at this time, I have on there one of, but I did a little bit more research, they are currently the fastest growing Christian based religious group in the world. Not so much in the United States, but in other countries. They are growing by leaps and bounds. And much of it is due to the fact that they stress evangelism. Every person that is a part of that group is expected to be an evangelist. And so now they are the fastest growing group that claims to have any type of Christian affiliation whatsoever. The second group that we see that rises out of that period is what's now known as Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventists arose from a group that was originally known as the Millerites. The Millerites had come to follow the teachings of a man by the name of William Miller. William Miller, who interestingly enough, made three predictions about the second coming of Christ. Twice in 1843 and once in 1844. Well, the first date passed by, and he said, well, I made a miscalculation. And so he came up with another date. The second date passed by, and Jesus still had not come again. And so that passed by, and he said, well, I got the year wrong this time. First off, it was the month. Now he says, I got the year wrong. It's actually going to be 1844. Well, 1844 passes by, and there are many of his followers that realize that, for lack of better terminology, he was a quack. That he really, he didn't know what he was talking about. He, where he really wasn't this, this great religious leader that they thought that he was. And so you had what history has recorded as the great disappointment. Well, there were some of the followers of Miller who, after the great disappointment, 
they began to align themselves with the teachings of a woman by the name of Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White claimed that she was receiving revelations from God. She claimed that she had been given a prophetic gift and that the things that she was that she was speaking was literally the inspired word of God. Well, the teachings that she began to focus upon. You notice the three things that I have listed here. And Seventh-day Adventists continue to hold to many of these things today. Certain portions of the old law, things like keeping the Sabbath day, they will still meet on Saturday rather than uh, on the first day of the week. They will meet on Saturday. They hold to certain portions of the old law. There are certain of the feasts and uh, even some of the sacrifices. Now, they don't uh, carry out those rituals in the exact ways that the Jews did, but they continue somewhat based upon that Jewish calendar to observe certain days and, and times and feasts and things of that nature. But also, they have very, very strict dietary restrictions. You will find that among Seventh-day Adventists, you have more vegetarians who are a part of that group than any other religious group. Because many of them take the strict dietary regulations of the Old Testament, but take them even a step further. And they will not eat any meat whatsoever. Now, they're not all that way, but many of them are. But their main teaching, if you ever listen to any of the, the, their preachers or you read any of the books that they write, the main focus of their teaching is to get ready because Jesus is coming again. This idea of Adventism, it goes along with premillennialism. Jesus is about to come again. He's about to set up his kingdom on earth. He is about to begin that thousand-year reign, which, of course, all of this is false doctrine. It's a misinterpretation of the book of Revelation. But this is the main focus of nearly every lesson that is taught in that religious body. Now one of the things that they stress that is important is making sure you're ready. Be prepared. We teach that as well. We don't know when Jesus is coming again. We need to be prepared. But they take it to another level. A group that you don't hear near as much about today as you did even even a generation ago is a group known as Christian Science, or as they have come to refer to themselves, the Church of Christ Scientist. You may see uh, buildings in certain larger cities where you'll get close to the building and you'll see the sign out front. It'll say Church of Christ, and then in smaller letters below it, Scientist. Well, what this is, is this religious group known as Christian Science. Well, it began in the 1860s, a woman by the name of Mary Baker Eddy. She believed that she was receiving visions from God, revealing truths. Now listen to this. Revealing truths that had been kept hidden from the time of the apostles. She claimed that the things that she was receiving, all of the apostles knew about these things, but they didn't share them with anybody else. And then suddenly in the 1860s, God decides that he's going to reveal these things to this woman. Well, from the things that she claimed to receive, it was this idea that we commonly would refer to today as mind over matter. She developed this theological mindset that pain, illness, and reality are all mental conditions. If you are in pain and you get your mind right, that pain will go away. If you have an illness and you get yourself right with God and your mind is right, that illness is going to go away. Reality, if the, ra- if the reality that you see around you is one that's not good, then you need to change your mind. You change your mind, then that will change everything. They believe that through correct discipline and training of the mind, 
that you could essentially control every illness and every disease. This is a group that many years ago got a lot of bad press because of their opposition to modern medical practices. They are opposed to things such as vaccinations. They are opposed to things such as blood transfusions. And what really began to bring about the demise of this group is they began to lose many children. Children would become ill with the normal childhood illnesses that children would have, things that with vaccinations and uh, antibiotics and the things that we have available to us today are able to be cured and they're able to be restored to their health, they would say, no, we can heal our children just on prayer. If we get our mind right, we get our faith right, then our child will be spared. But if our child dies, then we must be lacking in some way. And so they had many people who began to lose their lives to curable illnesses because of this mentality that it's all in your head. It all has to do with your thought process. If you're thinking positive things, if you are having the right mindset about God and about faith, then you're going to be able to ward off or heal any kind of illness or infirmity that comes along. The next group, Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a group that originally was known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. You come across many of their older books, they will have either that terminology or they will have the designation Millennial Dawn. And so if you come across any type of literature that says Watchtower or Millennial Dawn, you know that what you have is something that has been written by Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, it was started around 1872 by a man named Charles Taze Russell. And Russell, he created the Watchtower Society in order to promote his beliefs. These doctrines were ones that he came up with on his own. They derived their name from their practice of evangelizing others. But also, one of the unique things about them they claim that the only scriptural name that you can refer to God by is Jehovah. Well, it has been proven that this term Jehovah is really just a Latin derivative of, of, of the word in the Hebrew. And so whether that word is literally Jehovah or whether that is just the way that it's uh, the way that it's pronounced in the Latin language, we really don't know. But what we do know is that the Bible mentions many different designations for God. But to them, the only scriptural way to refer to God is by Jehovah. Another interesting thing about the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have their own translation of the Bible. If you ever come across the New World Translation of the Scriptures... This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. And they went through and they essentially took the King James Version. And they went through and anything in the King James Version that stood opposed to their beliefs, they either changed it or they took it out. And they published their own translation of the Bible. Some of their unique doctrines, of course, this belief in the one name of God... They believe that Jesus is not divine. They believe that Jesus is a created being, just like you and I. That Jesus was just a man. Yes, he was a good man. He was a good prophet. But he is not divine. He is not the Son of God. They say that there is no Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is just somewhat of, of a life force or a power that's out there. That the Holy Spirit is not literally an entity, as we would think with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They believe in only Jehovah God. There are not these other entities. But also one of their unique ideas is that there is no heaven, there is no hell. They believe in what we might refer to as perpetual existence on earth. 
And what they believe is that if you have lived your life faithful to their doctrines, when you die, that there's going to be a resurrection one day, the earth's going to be purified, there's going to be a resurrection one day, and that if you have lived faithful to their doctrines, then you will be resurrected to life again, physical life here on this earth. And this is going to be a continuous cycle of life, death, life, death. And this is going to go on for eternity. Well, what about those who die unfaithful to their doctrines? Well, have you ever heard of the doctrine of annihilationism? They claim that what happens if you die in an unfaithful state, then you're simply going to cease to exist. Your soul is not going to be condemned to punishment for all of eternity. You just don't get to stay in this cycle. You don't get to be a part of the resurrection and live another life here on this earth. You simply cease to exist. Those are some of their unique doctrines. How many of you knew that the Salvation Army is actually a church? Is actually a religious denomination? Probably not very many because in our part of the country we really don't see very many of their churches. We see their thrift stores. We see their homeless shelters. We see their soup kitchens. But we don't see their churches. The Salvation Army was established by William Booth in England in 1865. And essentially it was a branch of Methodism. Most of the doctrines that they hold will align with the Methodist church. And they hold to John Wesley's ideology of salvation by grace alone. But one of the things that sets the Salvation Army apart is they take every one of the passages in the New Testament that picture Christians and the church as being soldiers or an army, and they take that literally. And they say we are to establish ourselves, we are to clothe ourselves, we are to refer to us uh, to ourselves by military titles. And so whenever you see some of their officers, they're always wearing a uniform that looks like they're in the military. Some religious groups, you know, they'll refer erroneously to their preachers as pastors or reverends or what have you. They refer to theirs as generals. If we were a Salvation Army church, you would have to refer to me as the general. But you see, it all comes down to this concept of literalizing that one aspect of those figurative passages of Scripture. Well, the Salvation Army is known less today as a denomination. They they do have a very small Salvation Army church in Jonesboro. But what we see and think of more often is the bell ringers at Christmas time, the thrift stores, and the work that they do with the homeless. They are very, very well known for their promotion of what we might refer to uh, as the social gospel. Reaching out with to help the social needs more so than the religious needs of individuals. Then we come into what is probably the largest of these religious beliefs that came out of the Second Great Awakening, and it's what's known as Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism originated in the beginning of the 20th century, and what many people don't realize, do you know what religious group Pentecostalism originally came out of? Methodism. Wesleyan Methodism. What you had in Topeka, Kansas, you had a man by the name of Charles Parham. Charles Parham was a very charismatic Methodist Wesleyan preacher. And he began to teach this idea that people today still needed to manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit as signs of their salvation. And so he had people, and 
All of this is very well documented. He would get people stirred up into just a fever pitch of emotion. And then he would convince people that they had received the Holy Spirit. And over time, that evolved into modern day faith healing and uh, what they claim to be speaking in tongues, which something that's always been interesting to me, when you look at the New Testament, every instance that we have of someone speaking in tongues, they were speaking a known language. But those that promote those things today, they teach that what is being said is a heavenly ecstatic utterance. Meaning you are speaking the language of heaven. Or as I heard one preacher say one time, you are speaking the language of the angels. Well, this is so far removed from the practice that took place in the first century. But also, we need to understand that there is not a single place in the New Testament where it tells us that you are not saved unless you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, what did Jesus tell us in Mark 16, 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not he that believeth and is baptized and speaks in tongues shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, this ended up spreading from Kansas to the West Coast. And it moved into Los Angeles... And there was a movement there known as the Azusa Street Revival. If you ever study this, this was a major turning point, I guess you would say, in this belief system. And as a result of these doctrines being promoted, you see many, many different denominations that began to be formed. And most of these were formed between the years of 1901 and 1920. Groups such as the Assemblies of God, Churches of God, the United Pentecostal Church, the Apostolic Pentecostal Church, all of these trace their origin back to Charles Parham and his teachings there in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. But ultimately what we find is that among Pentecostals, they came to have a variety of different ideologies, a variety of different doctrines, Around the year 1914, there were some who promoted this idea that baptism, because Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says that we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There were some who began to promote this idea that if you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that your baptism is not acceptable that you have to be baptized only in the name of Jesus. And the way they rationalize that, they say, well, Jesus was here on earth, and he said at that point to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But after Jesus ascended back to heaven, that changed. Because when Peter stood up to preach on that day, and they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? He didn't say be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, these individuals, then in order to give further credence to that belief, they developed what has come to be known as the oneness doctrine. What they believed was that before Jesus came to earth, you had one entity of what we think of as the Godhead, but you had just one entity. You had God. And then when Jesus came to this earth, God essentially separated himself into two. And Jesus came to earth. Well, when Jesus ascended back to heaven, he assimilated back into God and you had just one entity again. But then, since Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit, they divided again. So you had Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so what they believe, they've come to believe this idea that Jesus himself is the one and only God. That there are not three entities of the Godhead. That all you have is Jesus. You may have heard of the Jesus only movement. Well, this is this concept of oneness Pentecostalism. 
This is the same group that believes that women are not to have short hair, are not to wear makeup. They have very strong standards of dress and appearance. Women are not to wear slacks. They are to wear skirts or long dresses. Many of them will even forbid the wearing of jewelry, even to the point that they do not even wear wedding bands. And so we find that there are a variety of different groups that align themselves with Pentecostalism, but probably one of the most well-known movements to come out of this is what we might refer to as the charismatic movement. Well, what has brought about the charismatic movement? You recognize any of those people up there? Televangelism. Televangelism. Well, you had many of these Pentecostal evangelists that began to have television shows, that began to have ministries that were worldwide. They began to promote their doctrines. And over time, we see that they developed great followings. Every one of the men that's pictured on this screen ended up being millionaires, and a couple of them billionaires, because they began to promote a doctrine known as the prosperity gospel. And essentially what their claim was, was if you donate 1% to God, he's going to give you 10% back. And so they had people donating vast sums of money to them in the belief that by doing that, that God was going to bless them with financial riches. Well, the only ones that got rich in the process were the evangelists, were the ones that were promoting those things. And so we find that with what history has referred to as the third wave of Pentecostalism, and you had that initial wave around 1901. You had the later wave of the oneness Pentecostal splitting off. Then you had this third wave that came about through the promotion of televangelism. And as a result of this, we see many new charismatic denominations that came to be formed. The last thing that I want us to look at tonight, and this is something that some of you who are older, you may remember hearing about this years ago. It's what is now known as the International Church of Christ. It started out being known as the Crossroads Movement or the Boston Movement. Some of you may remember back in, I believe it was in the 60s when this really started. And it started with a man by the name of Kip McKean. And Kip McKean was hired as the college minister for the Crossroads Church of Christ in Gainesville, Florida. Well, he developed what he referred to as the discipling practice or the discipling movement. And ultimately, what he did starting out was a good thing because he was taking these young people and following the pattern of 1 Timothy chapter 5, he was taking those who had been Christians for longer, pairing them up with these younger Christians and just to get them to you know, take them under their wing and support them and help them along. But it began to evolve into something more sinister. Because what it eventually evolved into was this mindset that whatever your mentor tells you to do, you have to do it. And so you had people who were told who they could marry, who they could not marry. You had people who were told where they could go to college, where they couldn't, what majors they could have, where they could live. You had people who were told down to the penny, how much they had to contribute to certain works. And so you see, this really came to be abused in many ways. Well, eventually, around 1979, I guess it was. Yeah, that's what I've got on the screen. Around 1979, Kip McKean kind of saw the writing on the wall. The elders of the Crossroads Church were taking a lot of heat, and rightfully so. They were allowing things to take place that shouldn't be taking place. And so Kip McKean in 1979 
gets up before the Crossroads congregation and makes an announcement that the Lord had spoke to him, told him to move to Boston, Massachusetts and start a new church there. Well, as soon as he and all of his followers left, the Crossroads congregation repented. They're no longer in existence today. They merged with another congregation. But they repented of the things that they had done, came back to a position of faithfulness. But McKean and his followers, they went to Boston. The Crossroads Movement came to be known as the Boston Movement. Well, almost immediately, they began pressing these discipling practices into motion there. They added instrumental music to the worship services. They began to allow... Uh, women to serve in various roles in that religious group that women do not have the authority uh, to be a part of. And so, we find that eventually, it even went so far that I can't remember when it was, I want to say it was back maybe late 80s, early 90s, that 2020 actually did a documentary on this Boston movement and the cult-like practices that were a part of that group. Well, because of the heat that they began to get because of that, they decided that they needed to change their name. And they changed it to the International Church of Christ. But what is interesting is many of these groups... You go into any large city in the United States today where there is a large university, you are more than likely going to find an international church of Christ. But most of these groups do not refer to themselves as the international church of Christ. They refer to themselves simply as the church of Christ. And so there have been a lot of people that been traveling. They'll come into these places. They will see a congregation that's referred to as the Church of Christ. They walk in and they're surprised to find that it's not what we're used to. They're surprised to find that it is a Boston movement or international Church of Christ. But they are wearing simply the title Church of Christ. Well, some of the indicators, of course, like I said, these doctrines of McKean with the discipling movement, um, the use of instrumental music, women in leadership. But we see, and this, this is really where I want us to stop for tonight. We find that from about the year 1960 on, what took place in this country in the 60s? Rebellion? Upheaval? a further pressing of this idea of individual freedom. From about the 1960s on, the idea of religious freedom has led to a large number of independent churches, a large number of independent movements that have come into existence. They all claim to have no denominational affiliation whatsoever. They are not affiliated with any established church But most of them, their ideology follows whatever the theological stance of their preacher is. Some of them will be more charismatic. Some of them will be more uh, similar to a mainline group like Baptist or Methodist, something of that nature. But as well, (coughs) we see that some of these denominations that we've talked about have come to band themselves together in a variety of ways. And we see several of these movements that have come about that we'll talk about more in depth in our next lesson. But a few of those, just briefly, you have evangelicalism, you have ecumenism, fundamentalism, community churches, house churches, mega churches, the emergent church, that's an interesting one, and theme-based churches. So from 1960 on, you really don't see that many new quote-unquote denominations being formed. But you find a lot of different religious movements taking place among established religious groups. And many of those spill over into a wide variety of different arenas. And we find some of these even beginning to impact the Lord's Church. 
And so that's what that's where we're going to stop for tonight. I'll I'll talk to you in just a minute, Barb. But let's let's go ahead. Let's bring this to a close. And as we bring this to a close, we always like to stop and we like to reflect upon our spiritual condition. I know these lessons that we're looking at aren't ones that are necessarily evangelistic in nature. But it may be that there is someone here that you realize there's something in your life that doesn't need to be. You realize there's sin there. And you want to have the prayers of the church. You want to have uh, that sin forgiven. Well, we encourage you to repent of that sin. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Be restored to the faith. Or if there's someone who has never obeyed the gospel, and tonight you realize the need to do so, then we encourage you to place your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess that faith, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come while we stand and sing. <laughs>